Okay, on to chapter two to learn more about the preacher and his family that got shipwrecked in the South Pacific. Chapter two is Return to the Wreck. The next day we were awakened at dawn by the crowing of the roosters just outside our tent. Over a breakfast of lobster meat and biscuits, Elizabeth and I made plans for our first full day on the island. Don't you think you should investigate the land on the other side of the river and see if it's as lush and green as Fritz says it is, she asked. You're right, I told her. We definitely should compare the two areas before deciding where to build our home. Keep your eyes open for any sign of the crew, Elizabeth called, as Fritz and I started on our journey. There they are. That makes me jealous. Lobster for breakfast. Yum. I love lobster. With this in mind, we chose a path near the shore so that we would be in a position to spot the sailors quickly. But alas, there was no one in sight. All we could see was the wreck bobbing up and down in the azure blue sea. We had just crossed a shallow part of the river when Turk came bounding up and, taking the lead, guided us through the tall grass and tangled vegetation to the top of a hill. The world we discovered that day was truly a tropical paradise. We passed through forests of towering trees of all types, fields of sugar and rolling hills of grass, leafy green plants, and fragrant flowers. Brightly colored birds darted across our path, and monkeys chatted in the trees as they watched our every move. At noontime, we entered a forest of palm trees. The monkeys, frightened by Turk's barking, scurried to the treetops. So there they are looking at the wreck but not seeing any of the sailors. I wonder what happened to them all. From the top of the trees, the monkeys watched as we ate our lunch of leftover lobster and biscuits. They were making hostile noises and grinding their teeth all the while. Suddenly, Fritz leaped to his feet. Father! I have an idea, he cried. I'm going to put these monkeys to work. With that, he began throwing stones at the treetops. This infuriated the monkeys, and they began tearing off all the coconuts they could reach and hurling them down at us. Laughing loudly at the success of his scheme, Fritz opened up some of the coconuts with his hatchet. He passed one to me, and we thirstily drank the milk we both agreed was not all that tasty. I've had coconut milk. It's, it smells good, but mm. in late afternoon, we headed for home, weighted down by a sack of Fritz's coconuts, a large bundle of sugar cane, and a collection of plates, bowls, and spoons that we had fashioned from gourds. Along the way, we had still another tussle with a troop of monkeys, this time on the ground. There they are. Monkeys are throwing the coconuts at them. Turk, barking loudly, charged into their midst and brutally attacked a female monkey who was cradling a baby in her arms. No, Turk, Fritz shouted, rushing to the rescue. But it was too late. Turk not only killed the monkey, but he completely devoured her as well. At first, her little orphan baby hid in the grass, but then he scampered out and climbed up on Fritz's shoulders. Father, can't I take him home with me, Fritz begged. I will feed him my share of the coconut milk and take good care of him. All right, bring him along, I replied. I suppose it's the least we can do. No bigger than a kitten, the little monkey rode gleefully home on Fritz's shoulders. They were greeted with shouts of welcome by the other boys, and the monkey soon became a real family favorite. There's a picture with the little monkey on his shoulder. That's kind of a bad dog. Killed that monkey and ate it just like that. A 
Elizabeth was delighted with our haul and she showed us how she too had been busy while we were gone. She had made a turnspit on which little Frances was now roasting a goose. Beneath the goose, she had spread out oyster shells to make a perfect drip pan. You know, my dear, I said after I had taken my first bite of the goose, I do think the land we explored today would make us a good home. However, before I begin such a project, I think we should bring the animals in from the wreck. I'm sure you're right, Elizabeth said, passing around some Dutch cheese from one of the casks. Otherwise, they will wash away in the first rough sea. Fritz and I will leave it done. I don't like leaving you and the other boys alone, so before we go, I will erect a pole with a white sail flying. If an emergency arises, take down the sail and fire a gun three times. And there she is. They're roasting the goose. I wouldn't necessarily kill the goose. I would wait for the goose to kind of mate and lay eggs and have babies before I started killing them off and eating them, but whatever. With the signal pole erected, Fritz and I sailed back to the wreck early in the morning. The first thing we did was to load up six of the tubs with the provisions we found on board. Kitchen utensils, a silver service, metal plates, chests of wine and butter, hams, sausages, sacks of grain and potatoes, farm implements, hammocks, and blankets. Filled to the brim now, the tub sat dangerously low in the water. See, they would have had all that on board, not only to feed people while they were sailing, but also when they got to the place they were going to colonize, they wouldn't have necessarily food right away. They would need to have that food um, stored to get them started on creating that little, little village they were going to do. Fritz then attached a sail and a rudder to our little ship to help speed the voyage back to land. Perhaps we could make a raft for all of the animals, he suggested. Now, son, how could we persuade a cow, a mule, six sheep, two goats, and a pig to get on a raft, much less remain still long enough to ride to shore? No, we'll have to think of something else. How about life jackets, Fritz cried. We can make each animal a life jacket. At first I laughed, but then I decided it was worth a try. There they are. There's all the animals up on the big ship, and there's their little barrels now all just full of good things for them. Each life jacket consisted of two casks, one on either side of the animal. These were tied together by leather thongs with a large cork underneath for buoyancy. One by one, each animal was fitted with his life jacket then pushed into the sea. After only a moment underwater, the animals quickly bobbed up and began swimming toward the shore. Mighty proud of ourselves and in high spirits over the success of our experiment, Fritz and I hopped in the two empty tubs, one on each end of the boat. We're off, I shouted. With the wind filling our new sail, it took no time to get halfway to land. Suddenly, Fritz grabbed me by the arm. Father, Father, look what's coming. I turned my head just in time to see a big slippery creature rise to the surface and then plunge beneath the waves again. I sat frozen for heading straight toward the animals was the biggest shark I had ever seen. There they are out there in the water. And if you look real close, you'll see the shark fin over there. They're in a lot of trouble. And that was the end of that chapter.